on World News Tonight. Tropical storm. Hurricane Henri makes landfall in the United States, promising much more extensive damage to the region. Rising tensions. Israel fires rockets into Hamas, held Gaza Strip in retaliation to border offenses. Climate protests. Extinction Rebellion takes to the streets of London, calling for change in climate laws. Animal rights. South Korea to pass a bill giving rights to our furry friends to protect them from abuse of any kind. From the global resources of the Verena Media Network, this is Ada Verena World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the storm that's ravaging through the U.S. Tropical storm Henri has been downgraded from a hurricane, but it hit New England with heavy rains and powerful winds. Thousands lost power and massive waves crashed on the coastline. Flooding is one of the major concerns as 38,000 million people are on some alert of floods. Tropical storm Henri tore through New England, downgraded from a Category 1 hurricane, but still packing a powerful punch after landfall. With heavy rains and damaging winds. Oh my God. As it blew through Rhode Island, it knocked out power to tens of thousands. I'm pleased to report the national grid has crews already out across the state working on restoration. President Biden saying federal support is standing by. FEMA has already pre-positioned resources in the region to speed our ability to respond. Massive waves crash the coastline, closing Narragansett Beach. Residents venturing out when it appeared the worst was over. In Connecticut, more problems with power. At least 24,000 customers losing electricity. With winds clocking over 50 miles per hour in Massachusetts, trees didn't stand a chance. And further inland, roads turning treacherous. A damaging blow from Henri as it winds down and moves out. The death toll in the major earthquake that struck Haiti on August 14th has risen to 2,207. Authorities said as attacks on aid convoys have complicated efforts to bring relief to survivors. Burying his family. Edouard Moran carries the coffin of his 15-year-old daughter, Kelly. Also being laid to rest, his 10-year-old niece, his 4-year-old nephew, and his mother. Like thousands of families in Haiti, the Moran's home was destroyed in the quake. Under the remaining rubble, the search for survivors continues. While a week has passed since the earthquake struck, this team of rescuers from Mexico remains hopeful. Meanwhile, flooding and damaged roads have hampered efforts to deliver much-needed humanitarian aid. Gangs have used the opportunity to attack aid convoys. When the trucks finally reach their destination, some have been looted by desperate residents. On Friday, the UN's Deputy Secretary General visited the injured and said the earthquake could be an opportunity to rebuild a better country. A promise Haitians have heard before after the 2010 earthquake, which killed more than 200,000 people. Now taking a closer look at the situation in Afghanistan, while no one knows for sure what will happen to Afghanistan following the swift takeover by the Taliban, the militant group claims it will form what it describes as an inclusive new government. To make matters worse, U.S. intelligence has warned personnel in Kabul of an imminent ISIS attack and to take extreme precautions. A week after the Taliban swept into Afghanistan's capital after seizing control of the whole country, the militant group now claims it had no plans to take over Kabul. In an interview with Al Jazeera on Sunday, a senior member of the group said the Taliban initially wished to reach a political solution and to form a joint and inclusive government. He added that as the U.S. pulled out, it left them no other choice but to enter and take over security in the city. On the issue of forming a new government, the representative said consultations are underway, stressing it's going to be an inclusive system. He added the talks include whether to keep Kabul as the capital or to move it to the Taliban's birthplace of Kandahar. Reuters also reports that the Taliban will possibly unveil a blueprint for the new government in the coming weeks. 
Citing the group's spokesman, the report says the Taliban aims to meet with leaders of some 20 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces over the next several days to ensure their safety and seek cooperation. The spokesman also stressed that schools and colleges across the country can open. Amid the intensifying chaos across Afghanistan, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on CBS on Sunday that Afghanistan's ex-president Ashraf Ghani fled the country just a day after the two were on the phone where he vowed to fight to the death against a militant group. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said in a separate interview that nobody predicted the Afghan government would fall in just 11 days. He also said previous assessments stated it could take several months or even one or two years before the Afghan government fell. Austin also said the U.S. saw the Afghan military surrendering and, quote, evaporating as the Taliban began to gain ground. 28,000 Americans already evacuated from Afghanistan in just over a week, says U.S. President. However, pressure is now mounting on the Biden administration to rescue Americans and allies still on the ground. President Biden conceding the evacuation from Kabul has been hard and painful. We have a long way to go. And a lot could still go wrong. Acknowledging military discussions on whether to stay beyond the August 31st deadline. Our hope is we will not have to extend. And expanding the safe zone around the airport. The security environment is changing rapidly. As the situation outside the airfield continues to deteriorate. A State Department memo obtained revealing that 150 unauthorized individuals rush through the gates whenever they're opened. Senior officials concerned over a possible attack on crowds from ISIS. There are still at least several thousand Americans stranded in Afghanistan. The White House not ruling out sending additional forces to help. With the president seeking daily input from his military commanders on the possibility of more troops. In a 30-hour period this weekend, the U.S. military helped airlift 11,000 people from Kabul. The Biden administration negotiating agreements with two dozen countries on four continents to serve as transit points. Military planes touching down regularly at Rammstein Air Base in Germany. The Pentagon activating emergency use of 18 commercial aircraft to fly evacuees from third-party countries to America, saying it won't impact U.S. flights. Once refugees arrive, many will be temporarily housed at the Dulles Expo Center in Chantilly, Virginia, before being transported to army bases across the country. Now in the Levant, Israel's military bombed Palestinian terrorist weapons site in the Gaza Strip early in response to a violent demonstration on the perimeter fence that left an Israeli police officer critically injured. Airstrikes light up the night sky in Gaza. A raid from the Israeli military, which says it targeted four weapons sites belonging to Hamas. The overnight bombings came hours after violent clashes along the border, protesters hurling explosives, and Israeli forces using live ammunition. Israel says a policeman is in critical condition, while Gazan authorities say dozens were injured. The protests were called for by Hamas, which controls the Gaza Strip and were designed to mark the anniversary of the burning of Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque 52 years ago. The violence is among the worst since Israel and Hamas brokered a ceasefire three months ago, an accord that itself put an end to the pair's deadliest fighting in years. Reconstruction in Gaza has largely stalled since then, with Israel maintaining heavy restrictions on imports and exports, though earlier this week the government authorized aid from Qatar, cash transfers to families in need, to be overseen by the United Nations. Going into short commercial break, we'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back over in Europe now. The German Chancellor met the Russian president in Moscow on the first anniversary of the Kremlin critics' poisoning. The meeting was said to improve German and Russian relations and to collaborate in improving infrastructure and so on in both countries. German Chancellor Angela Merkel will hold talks in Moscow with Russian President Vladimir Putin later today. It'll be Mrs Merkel's first trip to the Russian capital since January 2020 although she has held telephone consultations with Mr Putin several times since then. 
Dr. Stefan Meister, a political scientist, acknowledges relations between the two are frosty, to say the least. In principle, we're at the lowest point in German-Russian relations. It only gets lower every year. She won't be able to move anything there. But she will, of course, discuss the issues. Nord Stream 2, Donbass, security issues in Afghanistan, and that's ultimately about her legacy. Talks around Nord Stream 2 will be tense. The pipeline will transport natural gas from Russia to Germany. It's hugely controversial as critics fear it will essentially hand control over Europe's gas supply to Moscow. It's also a year since the poisoning attack on Alexei Navalny, the Putin opponent imprisoned in Russia in a case clearly motivated by political revenge, something Mrs Merkel hasn't forgotten. It's not good to use people as the object of aggressive action. We condemn that, and of course I will always make that clear, no matter where I am. Whether I'm talking to my colleague from Estonia or with Russia. The meeting marks the end of what has been a tumultuous relationship between the pair. Mrs Merkel is currently serving out her fourth term as Chancellor. She will step down at the end of it after almost 16 years in charge. The September the 26th federal elections will decide who succeeds in her role and who will be left to forge a new relationship with Vladimir Putin. Climate change activists climbed to the outside of the headquarters of the City of London's government as they began two weeks of protests focused on the capital's financial district. For more on this, we have Abu Dhar in a World News Special Correspondent Ranusha De Silva reporting from Kent in England. Ranusha? Yes, Shinali. About 200 demonstrators from the group Extinction Rebellion targeted the medieval guild hall, the home of the City of London Corporation, which governs the city's historic financial centre. Three activists climbed the facade of the ornate guild hall, parts of which date back to the 15th century, lit red flares and displayed a banner that said, co-liberation, freedom together. Scuffles broke out between demonstrators and security personnel at the site. Extinction Rebellion, which caused days of traffic chaos in London two years ago, said it is targeting the city's financial district, which they blame for helping to fuel climate change. The group wants an emergency response from governments and a mass move away from polluting industries to avert the worst scenarios of devastation outlined by scientists. The City of London is the smallest local authority in Britain, and unlike most conventional British councils officially declares its job is to reinforce the importance of financial services to the British economy. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adi Darana World News Special Correspondent Ranusha De Silva reporting from Kent in England. Moving on to Australia now, thousands of protesters defied coronavirus lockdowns to hit the streets of Australia's largest cities as the country recorded its highest single day caseload since the pandemic began. Now crossing over to Adi Darana World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Timothy. Yes, Shinali. Hundreds of unmasked protesters were seen marching through Melbourne's central business district before confronting police. Hours after, a snap lockdown was announced for the entire state of Victoria. Six officers were hospitalized in the protests, suffering suspected broken noses, a broken thumb and concussions. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the country must begin to ease strict COVID-19 restrictions only once it reaches higher vaccination rates to contain a Delta outbreak. The sentiment was backed by New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian, who said that her state must learn to live with the virus and stress the importance of vaccinations. Western Australia and Queensland states have flagged that they may not stick to a plan reached with the federal government, even if vaccination rates hit 80%, raising concerns due to Sydney breaking new one-day records of infections. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adi Darana World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. In the Middle East, Israel launched antibody testing for children aged as young as three, seeking information on the number of unvaccinated youths who have developed protection against coronavirus ahead of the new school year. A pinprick and it's over. 
These children, ranging in age from 3 to 12, have come to be tested to find out if they ever had COVID-19. If the answer is yes, this means they have sufficient antibodies and won't have to quarantine if exposed to the virus. With children under 12 too young to be vaccinated, the Israeli government is hoping the antibody testing will help limit school year disruptions and allow the term to begin on time on September 1st. A recent study found that one in five children have COVID antibodies. Meanwhile, the country is continuing to offer a third dose of the vaccine as part of efforts to control the spread of the Delta variant. On Sunday, the government lowered the age required for the booster shot to 40 and included pregnant women teachers and health care workers who are even younger. More than 5.4 million Israelis have received two doses of the vaccine, just over 60 percent of the population. We have some good news for you. Climate change presents a variety of challenges to farmers, one being new kinds of pests. South Korea has been monitoring closely for the appearance of new pests, which is a labor-intensive endeavor. Thankfully, researchers have developed a way to check for them remotely using traps that they work autonomously. At this tomato farm, the leaves on some of the plants have been damaged by pests. There's a tiny insect on the back of the leaf, only visible if you look closely. Insect traps have been set up throughout the farm. Looking at the pests that have been caught by the traps helps identify which bugs are causing the damage. Some of the insect traps have a solar-powered device attached. These traps hold 40 adhesive strips that are automatically replaced. This allows farmers to leave the traps for up to nine months, saving them time and effort. Also attached to the devices are high-resolution cameras that send images of the pests to the farmers' mobile phones or computers. Test results of this new automatic pest-predicting trap developed by the Rural Development Administration show they reduce labor and other costs by 60 percent compared to traditional traps. It is also significantly more effective because not only can different traps be installed depending on the cultivation crop and environment, but adjustments and monitoring can be done remotely. Climate change is bringing more foreign or exotic pests to Korea, like the American fairy bug and brown cicadas. Effective pest prevention systems are needed to make sure these new pests don't destroy crops. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris met top leaders in Singapore on the first working day of a trip to Southeast Asia and struck partnerships to tackle cyber threats, supply disruptions and the COVID-19 pandemic. Japan will send a military aircraft to Afghanistan to bring back its citizens amid uncertainty in the country after the hardline Islamist Taliban seized power. More military transport planes are expected to be sent to Afghanistan to repatriate Afghans working in the Japanese embassy. Anti-government protesters clashed in Portland following separate rivals demonstrations. Pepper spray and possibly other explosive devices may have been used in the skirmishes but that it was not immediately clear which side had deployed them. Four miners trapped after a roof collapsed at a coal mine in northwest China's Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region were saved after 68 hours of being trapped. All victims have stable vital signs have been taken to a hospital for observation. Jacinda Ardern extended New Zealand's strict nationwide COVID-19 lockdown saying the current outbreak of the Delta variant of the current the virus had not yet peaked. The level 4 nationwide lockdown was extended by three days until midnight on August 27th. And finally tonight, South Korea is on its way to become a more animal-friendly country. Amending its civil code, the government will protect animals from abuse and abandonment by recognizing them as beings and not objects as they previously were. Animals will no longer be legally categorized as objects in South Korea. That's because the country plans to amend its civil code to grant animals legal status to prevent cases of abuse and abandonment. It must still be approved by parliament, likely in September, but the amendment would make Korea one of a few countries to recognize animals as beings with rights to protection 
and enhanced welfare. After Austria in 1988, Germany in 1990, and Switzerland in 2002. Korea's push comes amid a vast increase in its pet-owning population and the number of animal abuse cases over the last decade. Animals are not objects, they certainly aren't. But there are people who can't control their anger and take it out on their dogs. This dog's owner lost his temper and told his kids to bury him alive. He was barely alive when we rescued him after it was reported, but the man wasn't punished as the dog was recognized as an object owned by him. Once the act declares animals are beings and not things, advocates hope judges and prosecutors will have more options when sentencing abusers. Several supporters say it is not enough, though. On the contrary, the Korea Pet Industry Retails Association has pointed out that laws are already in place to ensure the safety of animals. Some critics fear the revision could result in unnecessary restrictions on pet shops and breeders, potentially making adoption more difficult. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.